in light of the recent Supreme Court decisions announced by the court as it ended its 2013-2014 session on June 30th, Book TV presents portions of author talks on the Supreme Court and the cases the court has handled. During the next hour, you'll hear from former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, and Georgetown Law Professor Randy Barnett. You can watch all of the programs featured here in their entirety on our website, booktv.org. We begin with Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, author of Uncertain Justice, The Roberts Court, and the Constitution. Here, Professor Tribe argues that while the Roberts Court is widely portrayed as being ideologically split, producing one five to four decision after another, there are many less publicized cases in which the liberals and conservatives on the court find common ground. One of the research assistants working with me this summer, a terrific kid named Max, went home to New Hampshire in late spring and spent some time talking with his high school music teacher. She knew that he went to Harvard Law School but didn't know that he was working with me and she kind of unloaded on him about her great disillusionment with the Supreme Court. She'd been looking at the headlines about how partisan the divisions seem to be. A lot of the people whose journalism she respects, people like Linda Greenhouse, were saying, uh, really, this is a very partisan, very polarized court. Why aren't they just a bunch of politicians in robes? Why should I trust these guys? And my, my student tried to reassure her that it's not really as bad as all that. Uh, she wasn't convinced. She told him she had listened to the confirmation hearings when John Roberts, who was going to become Chief Justice, um, made an analogy to umpires. Now, she was a baseball fan, and she didn't find the analogy very persuasive. She said that the new Chief Justice says he's only going to be an umpire calling balls and strikes. It's all neutral. It's all objective. People don't go to a ball game to see the umpire. They go to see the batters. They go to see the catcher. They see the pitcher. He was only going to be neutral. She didn't find it very convincing. She realized that there is judgment involved, even in the work of an umpire. Judgment about the strike zone. One umpire famously described it as a living, breathing document, the way some people like to describe the Supreme Court's constitution. She was a lot more convinced by what Elena Kagan said during her confirmation hearings, when she said that it's nowhere near that robotic or mechanical, especially in tough and close cases, which are the only ones that reach the court. Judgment is involved. We bring a lot of ourselves to the process of deciding cases. And that's as it should be, Max told her. And she responded. She was very bright. She didn't know a lot of law. But she said, look, if it's not what Roberts claimed he could make it, not just an umpire calling balls and strikes, why isn't it just a matter of unelected judges serving for life, imposing their political preferences on the rest of us? Now, Max is a very loyal research assistant. His reply was, well, read Larry Tribe's book. <laughs> Good for you, Max. <laughs> the umpire analogy, he told her, was great PR. And it actually did contain a germ of truth. Namely, good judges, like good umpires, should apply their philosophies consistently. They shouldn't bend them to cut slack for their favorite players or teams to help those that they like bring home the pennant or to hurt their political adversaries. That much is true. But of course, the umpire analogy is a vast oversimplification. It suggests that personal judgment, personal understanding of what the Constitution is about, what its ambiguous terms mean, what our national history commits us to uh, have nothing to do with it all. Ambiguous language like liberty, equality, 
ambiguous principles like what the role of the court should be, how active a role it should play in American life. All of those things don't come down from on high. They're not written in stone. They're not objectively decipherable. And we shouldn't expect justices not to bring their personal philosophies to bear, nor should we always expect to find their philosophies striking us as right or even as neutral when we might be coming from a different world view. Elections, of course, have consequences. And the selection of justices by a series of increasingly conservative Republican presidents with a certain perspective on the world and on the Constitution is among those consequences. The umpire analogy is off base, pun intended, uh, to the extent that it pretends that the system expects judges to be blank slates, to bring nothing of their views of the world and of the law uh, to the table. So Max did urge his music teacher to read the book. He said it would teach even legal experts some important lessons. But it would also be fun, he said, for her and other non-lawyers. It's filled with great stories about everything from really fascinating cases to the justice's personal obsessions with things like baseball. And one story that he mentioned to her that features in the book was about Justice Potter Stewart's devotion uh, to the Cincinnati Reds, which extended to making sure that his law clerks were watching this small TV that he set up in his chambers while he sat on the bench during the 1973 playoffs between the Mets and the Reds. The clerk knew his boss's priorities, and in mid-argument on some technical preemption case, he sent Stewart a note. Here's what the note said. Crane pool flies to right. Agnew resigns. <laughs> in that order. My research assistant went on to explain that reading Uncertain Justice, which he hadn't read, he helped me with a couple of footnotes, and it's like, you know, you touch the tail of an elephant, somebody else touches the trunk, someone else touches the underbelly, uh, but nobody has seen the elephant full. So he finally saw the elephant, and he had read it, and he said that reading it taught him that the standard story about the increasing number of five to four splits along political and even partisan lines made good press, but it shouldn't really disillusion her because it was a lot more misleading than informative. It turns out that only about a fifth of the cases since Roberts became Chief Justice in 2005 have been divided five to four. And at least a third of the five to four splits involve unlikely bedfellows, like alignments where one of the liberals, like Breyer or Sotomayor or Kagan, joins with Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito to create a five to four alignment in which the four dissenters are the other three liberals plus Scalia, who is invariably more protective of privacy rights from the government, and in that sense, more liberal than Breyer or pretty much any other justice. You wouldn't know that from the reputation that Scalia has nurtured as a radical, uncompromising conservative. Just yesterday, for example, Elena Kagan led a five to four decision that ruled against immigrant children who had the bad luck to turn 21 before their parents, who had green cards, got to the head of the slow-moving waiting line for an immigrant visa. Kagan's opinion was joined by Anthony Kennedy, a Republican, Ruth Ginsburg, a Democrat, and Kagan's conclusion was supported in a separate opinion written by Roberts and joined by Scalia. The dissenting justices who ruled in favor of the boy who had turned 21 after his mom who had immigrated from El Salvador in 1998, had waited in line for eight years. But it was his misfortune. He turned 21. He had to go to the end of the line. They were also unlikely bedfellows. Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Stephen Breyer, and Sonia Sotomayor. That was not that atypical. 
in lots of difficult and divisive cases. You get these unusual alignments. There was a